So some of you might know the show, Avatar Last Airbender. It's a kid show. Very good. I really like it. Zuko's the best character. You can't choose my mind. Uh, I was kind of going through it recently, and there was a scene that caught my attention that I felt related to what the sermon's going to be about. There's a, there is a scene where one of the main characters, Avatar Aang, goes to see a guru who's supposed to help him unlock this, you know, powerful ability. And the way the guru explains his process works is that he uses the comparison, like a real physical example of these pools. These pools that look like this, that kind of flow into each other and out into a river. Uh, each of these pools uh, basically represents, you know, energy flowing through the body. But things can block the pools, can like moss, algae, debris, can get into the openings and clog them up and prevent them from flowing. And then the water gets, you know, stagnant and kind of gets kind of icky as uh, it remains there. The way that he explains to unlock this ability and unlock these plugs, these debris from the pools within the body, was for the main character to go through and work through all of his trauma and woundedness and issues. It's in this similar vein that the Holy Spirit works in each of us, right? You know, the Holy Spirit is the water flowing through us, and the things that can block it and prevent from flowing are hardship, woundedness, hurt, different things that life throws at us. Which is why that process of clearing the debris is healing, that concept of healing, which is what we're going to be covering today. So let me preface this with this. In case you guys didn't know, Satan is our enemy. If you didn't know that, then, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> Satan cannot affect God's salvation. We've been delivered into God's hands, right? However, he can negatively impact our effectiveness as kingdom builders. Because something we need to recognize is that as kingdom builders, we are a threat. We're trying to put ideas and mindsets and things into the world that he doesn't want out there. So, ever the strategist, he imposes strategy and uses life, the things that we go through, the hardships, to pull out the rock from under us and knock us off our feet and effect, impact our effectiveness as kingdom builders. So when he hits us, it always hurts. I think Tony has used this chart before in previous sermons. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but basically what this is is that this is a chart talking about uh, adverse uh, child experience or family experiences based on percentages. Uh, essentially at the top, in case you can't see from where you are, 47.9% of children nationwide experience at least one form of you know, adverse child effects or experiences. Uh, and those include, you know, socioeconomic hardship, divorce, experiencing divorce, living with someone who has had an alcohol or drug problem, being a victim or witness to neighborhood violence, living with someone who was mentally ill or suicidal, domestic violence, witnesses, parents were sent to jail, uh, treated or judged unfairly due to race slash ethnicity and death of a parent. And there's multiple other things that this could cover. This was data from 2012. I looked it up recently the CDC, that number is up to 60% now. And this is just accounting for, you know, childhood experiences. A different statistic showed that of all adults in 2022, 70 to 70 75% of them have experienced some form of trauma. I bring this up because I want everyone to understand that this is such a prevalent issue. There is such an intense need for healing. So as kingdom builders, it is really important that we build resiliency. Something that I've noticed as I was prepping and thinking about this sermon is that we all have very different backgrounds. 
We come from different places. We have different history. For me, those of you who have talked about here before, if I've shared with you, you know that I've been through a lot at a very young age. As a result of that, I kind of have a decent idea of how to handle things when life throws some hardship at me. Uh, think of it like, uh, for those of you who exercise or are at least aware of it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like uh, lifting weights, weight training. To get stronger, it requires, to build up strength and resiliency, it requires repetition and consistency and time. So for me, when I was younger, you know, I trade with, you know, 10 pounds, then I got up to 20 pounds, 30, 40, 50, to 100 maybe. So when life comes and throws me a, here, have a 200 pound weight catch, I have an, kind of an idea of how to handle it. But what happens if you don't have that background? You know, maybe you haven't experienced a, you know, a trauma yet, or you grew up, you know, a very stable house or didn't really have, or were thankfully not, uh, didn't experience any sort of ACE. What happens when you get thrown a 200 pound weight and you've had no training? You get crushed, essentially, is what happens. Which, what happens to a lot of people. Which is why it is important to build resiliency as kingdom builders. But not only for yourself. So this, we're not only going to cover healing yourself, but we're also going to cover healing others. A little bit of a disclaimer. When I say healing others, I don't mean you are not doing any of the healing. I don't want to hear any of the, oh, but I can fix them. No, you can't. <laughs> uh, that's not how this works. When I say healing, bringing healing to others, helping others build resiliency, what I mean is, is that you are providing an uh, the environment for God to work. That is what I mean by that. Which is why I'm going to try and show you, give you something practical for you to apply to yourself and show you how to heal yourself and, and bring that healing to others. So after a while of thinking about it, reflecting on my own past experiences, I kind of come up with a list of three things that are requirements for this to take place, both for yourself and for others. The first thing is honesty. The second thing you need is bravery. And the last thing, but not least, probably one of the most important things, is faith and hope. Originally, these two were separate, but praying about it, they're so interconnected that I decided, you know, they belong together. They don't deserve to be in the same category. So how is it going to work? Essentially, I'm going to go through each of these topics, and basically they're going to kind of be divided up into what does it look like to apply this to yourself, and what does it look like to apply this to others. So first we're going to start with honest. So what does it look like to need healing? How do you know? Because sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't know what to look for. Sometimes you, it's either been suppressed or it's been so long or dealt with it for so long that you think it is normal. One of the things that we, that a good step to start with is looking at sin areas. As a disclaimer, nothing of what I'm about to ask you is easy. So when you look at this list, be honest with yourself. Is there anything out here that jumps out at you? I'll be the first to say, yeah, I have, I have some of these. I can see where I, you know, I need healing in some of these areas. Beyond that, what about some of these behaviors? Do you lash out in anger? Are you defensive? Are you fearful? Do you have guilt or shame about something? If you're looking at this list and any of these jump out to you, that means you need healing. I know I do. As an example, when I first came to tech, I didn't know I had a hatred problem, that I hated someone a lot. Until I was at Bible study, reading through the Bible, and I'm reading a verse, and it's like, yeah, no, hatred, that's not the verse, hatred is bad. Uh, and I'm like, 
huh, okay, so this isn't a good thing. And the thing is that I had just dealt with that for so long that it had become my new normal. So I just lived with it. So the first part here is being honest with yourself, and that can be pretty hard. That's why things like heart charts, are, I think, are so important. It's such a valuable tool. And that's the interesting thing you're going to notice when I talk about, you know, healing with, you know, healing yourself and bringing healing to others. They're so closely intertwined because most of the time when you go through this process, you're going through it with someone else. Either you're the one leading, guiding them through this process, or you're the one being guided. You're the one reaching out who needs help. So if someone could get uh, Matthew 7, 4 through 5, for me, please. Uh, looking at this, I know the context for this verse can be a little bit interesting because Jesus is applying it to judging others. But I think this works here. Uh, if someone has that, Will? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, the context Jesus is talking about, you know, judging others, and, you know, you can't take the speck out of your brother's eye, you can't take the plank out of your own. This is in here because how can you try and lead someone through a struggle they're going with if you haven't acknowledged your own? Uh... It's one thing to, you know, acknowledge and be working on it as well. You can work on something with someone else. But it's very different to deny that you have an issue and try to help someone with theirs. So if you can't be honest with yourself first. It's going to be really, be really hard to guide someone else through that process. Because beyond that, this honesty with others applies to transparency and vulnerability. If you are able to be honest with yourself and share that you're also going through things with the person that you're leading or guiding, they're going to be much more willing to let you help them. Right? And with transparency and vulnerability, it opens a door for you to help them confront truths that maybe they don't want to admit. That's why I think things like to be training is so important because there is a way to approach things. People don't respond great to you being like, no, yes, you have this issue. Uh, you need to deal with it. That almost never goes well. Let me just say from experience that almost never goes ever well. That's why things like, you know, sitting 45 degrees from someone when you're talking to them, maintaining eye contact, open body posture, asking, you know, questions to make sure you're like, am I understanding this right? You know, when you say this, this is what I'm hearing. Am I hearing the right thing? And then confirm or, you know, readjust, correct you. I feel the need to continue adding a disclaimer to this portion because what I don't want is people to get a savior complex. You are not doing any of the healing. You are making a way for God to work through them. You're not the doctor. You're trying to get them to the doctor's office. <laughs> that is the entire goal here. That's something you guys really want to hammer home. With that, we move on to bravery. If someone can get Isaiah 41 and 43 for me. So... Looking into the context of the verses, I know these are kind of specific verses. The original context is that these two verses were written for Israel, from God to Israel. Uh, if someone has the Isaiah 41, 9 through 10, Jordan. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. 
Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Mm -hmm. So already we're getting, you know, do not be afraid. I am with you. I am your God. Who has Isaiah 43, 1 through 2? Let's see. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and flame shall not consume you. Already we're seeing multiple things here. You know, do not be afraid. I have redeemed you. I am with you. You are mine. Whenever you go through things, I am there with you. And while this originally was for Israel, we see this theme repeated multiple times, both in in other passages in Scripture, and especially in the New Testament. In uh, John 14, 1 through 4, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place I, where I am going. And with Romans eight thirty one. Uh, it says, what then shall we, s we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? I bring these up because we need to remind ourselves who has our back. God of the universe. That's a really good person to have, uh, to have at your back. And if you'll need to remind us because this stuff is scary. This stuff is painful. I don't like pain. I don't like going, I don't like having to confront all this stuff. It's scary and I would much rather not, but it is necessary. There are so many reasons to be afraid, but there's also so many other overwhelming reasons not to be. And let me just tell you, it is completely natural to fear, to feel fear, right? But I really like this quote, bravery is not the absence of fear, but action in its presence. What matters is what you do next, how you respond, right? Something that I never want anyone to do in this room is to sell yourself short or try to downplay what you go through, ever. I do not like that that is something that has implanted in a lot of us i say this because i have experienced it before people have come to me where they tell me man i feel bad dumping all this all of you you've been through so much more than me that is not the point of why i share all this stuff the point of why i share all the stuff that i do up here why i'm so open is to show you that it is possible to persevere if I can do it, so can you. Never downplay that. You and I have very different histories. If we did that, none of us could be able to feel bad for anything. Just talk to any person from a third world country. My own mother, I'd never be able to tell her anything because it's like, cool, yeah, I'm on this thing. You want up me in every area, but she... <laughs> But she has consistently told me, you know, that is not the point of why I tell you this stuff. The why I share my story with you is to show you what is possible with God. When it comes to bravery with others, let me tell you something. It is terrifying to share anything like this with other people. If someone has come to you with this sort of thing. That means so much already because they trust you enough and they feel that you care enough to share something really hard with you. It takes so much bravery to do that. And that ties into my other warning that I just said previously, you never want to convey that you're downplaying their struggle either. 
It goes both ways. That is why I give that warning and I'm connecting it back. Wording is important. The way you present things is important. If you want to share your story, don't be careful not to make it about yourself. And especially time back into, you know, the whole transparency, vulnerability with them, you sharing that with them makes them, you know, it encourages them and makes them feel braver because it is much easier to be brave with, brave with someone else than to do it alone. There is, akin to this, something that I want to cover, that a term that I've heard before that I can relate to. Standing in the gap. If you don't know what that means, essentially, you know, if a city has walls and it's under attack and a hole is blown through the wall, someone will stand in the hole and keep invaders out. They will fight them off until they can, you know, recollect itself and fix the hole and build it back up. Another reason why it takes so much bravery to guide others towards healing is because you are standing in the gap for them. Word of warning, if you think that Satan isn't going to come for you because you're standing in his way, you're wrong. You're putting yourself in the line of fire. He doesn't want you to hold the, hold the gap. He doesn't want you to stand on the gap. He wants, you, he wants that hole open so he can get in. This is a team effort. I say this from experience because I know this. It can be exhausting to do this, to be there for someone. There's so many things you wish you can do that you don't know if you can do. You don't know you don't know how to help. It can be exhausting physically, spiritually, mentally on yourself. This is a team effort. When I have to be there for someone, I need a support team too. You need someone backing you up when you're out there, when you're out there standing up for someone. Do not go this, through this alone. Rely on each other. We all love each other here. Let us help you. Let your family help you. Don't do it by yourself. Because if you're standing in the gap on your own, it's the same situation where Satan's going to target you. And you're going to be facing that line of fire by yourself. I think of it kind of like a conga line. You have like people at your back every step of the way, so you're supporting each other, and it becomes a lot harder for him to try to get to you. And beyond just us here physically, God has your back the entire time. Even if, you know, sometimes I know it's really hard to feel it, that he's there, but probably he never leaves. He's always there. I don't remember who said this. Someone said this before in a previous sermon. If you feel distant, he didn't move. He has not moved from where he is. And akin to this, when you're guiding someone through healing, you don't have to be fully healed to guide others. Why do I know that? Because I'm not. For 100% certainty, I can say I'm not. What matters is what you do, the way you respond. This process of healing is a progression at least in my experience. Never, ever downplay the progress you've made. A little bit of a personal story, big surprise. Uh, last semester, I went on a conference with a blaze. Right? Let me just say, I got spiritually mugged that, <laughs> that, that week. I got spiritually shanked. I had so many different things going on and personal things that I was struggling with and so much stress from school. And then the day that I was going to drive down there, I was on four hours of sleep. Don't ask me how I drove. I don't know. Uh, I get there and I am basically already beaten into the ground. And I get there, my social battery is at zero. 
you know, minute one in. And I'm with her with the other churches, and they're hitting all the right buttons in the worst way possible. What had happened was, was that they were saying things and doing things that reminded me of the very first church that I went to, which betrayed my family's trust and stabbed us in the back. And they were hitting all the right notes. It felt, I was like, this feels a little too familiar. So I went into fight or flight mode, and my choice was flight. I was out. Uh, I was pretty much checked out. I was not in a good headspace. Uh, as soon as it ended, I dipped. I was gone. I was out. I drove home. And let me tell you the shame that set in after that. Because here's me thinking, I thought I had dealt with this already. You know, I thought I was done. Why, why is this back? Why is this not over yet? So I dealt with it. I, there was shame and guilt all the way back to me driving back to my apartment. And then I had a sermon the next day. That was rough. Uh, and again, I'm just beating myself up over this. And then the week after, we had a retreat. And the theme of the retreat was, you know, you know I believe it was, you know, something like, uh, you know, not judging others, showing empathy, compassion, hope. That was, the, that was the theme of the retreat. And I'm sitting there, and, you know, I'm talking to Nick. I'm talking to Tony. I'm talking to different people. I'm just sharing. I talked to Jordan for a bit. Just sharing my experience and how I was feeling. And we get to a different seminar, uh, Adam's seminar, actually. And... He took the concept, the theme of the trip, and took it a step further. And was like, yeah, don't judge others. Be hopeful. Show grace. Show grace to yourself. And it's in that moment that I heard crystal clear from God, why are you being so hard on yourself? Something that I had neglected to notice while maybe my trigger was still there, the way I responded was very different. High school me, I would have suppressed all those emotions and just not talked about it, bottled it up until it came back to bite me later. But this time, I talked about it. I didn't stay silent about it. I shared how I was feeling. Obi would have never done that. He thought I was crazy. So when it comes to when you're dealing with your own hardships and struggles, give yourself some grace. Recognize the progress that you're making. And remind others, the people you love, that you care about, the progress that they're making. Because sometimes it's really hard to see it until someone else points it out. You know, hey, you would have responded this way earlier, but this time, sure, maybe it's still hard, but you responded in a completely different manner. Don't disregard the progress you make. With that comes the last thing required for healing, which is faith and hope. If someone can get Romans 12, 2, and James 2 through 4, which is my life verse, I know this, uh, none of this is going to work. You can have honesty and bravery in there. None of this will work without this, without faith and hope. If someone get Romans uh, 12 too. Who has that? Zach. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And just point out, these two particularly are with God. Not by yourself, with God. He can use what we're going through for fantastic things. I've seen it work. I've 
been alive, you know, I'm a living testament to that. Because apart from him, we can't do anything. But with him, we can. In these verses, Luke 5, 12, and 7, 50, they're examples. It's, you know, the Jesus healing the man with leprosy. He tells Jesus, you know, Lord, you can make me clean. In Luke 7, 50, Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. All of this requires faith and hope that it's going to work. As an example, when Jesus went back to Nazareth, and there was, he couldn't do anything because there was no faith there. If you believe you can't get better, you're not going to. That's just a fact. If you keep your heart open and fight for it and allow God to work in your life, he can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. In Psalm 77, I was, reading, I was reading through this. I actually heard this from The Chosen with a TV show, and it made me curious, and I went and went through it. It's a passage about desperation, crying out to God, you know, has his favor left me? Is there no hope? But then it turns around and reminds us, you know, of his power, of his mighty deeds, that he is powerful and he can do pretty much anything. There is hope. One of his biggest lies is that you can't get better. One of Satan's biggest lies is you can't get better. That is a complete lie, and I fight against that constantly. You can get better. I thought my father would never stop being an alcoholic. He'd been an alcoholic for most of his life, and now he's almost five years sober. My mother is a, survival, is a survivor of sexual assault. You would never know that by meeting her. I never thought I would learn to trust anyone. But I have so many people here in this audience that I trust a lot. That I would be up here at all sharing any of this with any of you. That has to be God because that was not me. That wasn't me. Things can't, you can get better. We serve a God of the impossible. So many things I just said I thought was impossible until I finally got out of the way and let God work. When it comes to bringing this to others, something that me and the leadership team have noticed is that this generation and people that follow are feeling really hopeless. They're like, you know what? I've been through these things. I can't change anything. This is who I am. I am stuck like this. I can't change. And that is another one of, it is the same lie that Satan keeps trying to tell us that we can't change. And that is a complete lie. I have experienced this. Let me tell you, there is few things as crushing as seeing someone you love and care about give up hope. It is heartbreaking. Our job, we're to remind them that there is hope. Hope exists. Show them God. How? Show them you. The person that God has made. Show them compassion. Show them love. Show them how much you desperately care about them and how much you're willing to be there for them. Again, something I've experienced a lot, there is a feeling of, like you don't have control. Let me tell you, so many times that people have come in with their stuff so desperately, I want to be like, I want to fix this. I want to put my hands in this. I just want to make this better. Let me tell you, that is not your field of expertise. That is not your job. That is God's area of expertise. That is his field. You're there to establish the environment and the ambience so the Holy Spirit can flow and work on them. It doesn't matter if they're a believer or not. 
My mom wasn't. For her entire, most of her life, she wasn't. She despised Christianity. But people came around and showed her that love. And she still remembers it to this day. I know it can feel like you're not doing a lot. There is so much that you're doing that you don't recognize. Don't do all the stuff that you can't do. Embrace what you can do for them. Being there, listening, being an open book, showing them that you know what, you're struggling through things too. That no matter what happens, you're going to be there for them. Embrace what you can do and show them that hope exists. Show them God by being a living example of it. I say this because I know what the worst case scenario feels like. In high school, I had a really close friend of mine. We sat next to each other at our engineering class. We work on projects together. Fun, really funny, really happy guy. We went for a winter break. I told him, hey bud, I'll see you after break. I get back and I learned that I lost him to suicide. Let me tell you, that, that fundamentally changed me. We had talked about joining the Navy together. Satan used that against me. I blame myself. Because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't this. I wasn't vulnerable. I wasn't, you know, open to, you know, sharing what I was going through or talking to people like this at this time. At least it wasn't a two-way street. I would hear from other people, but I wouldn't share what I was going through. And I just wondered, is there anything that I could have done? Satan used that against me a lot. If I had known, if I had known what he was going through, I would have fought for him 100%. That's why I harp on the importance of why even just coming, someone coming to talk to you about anything they're going through is such a big step. It's why I harp on, you know, not putting down anything that they're going through, all these different things, because I know what the worst case scenario feels like. And let me tell you, that, that was terrible. This is what spiritual warfare looks like. We're in the middle of it, whether we know it or not. The main thing that I want to have you all take away this break from this is that there is hope. There is hope that you can get better. There is hope that the people we love and care about can get better and that God has our backs regardless of whatever we go through. Do not believe the lie that you can't get better, that other people can't get better. That is a lie that Satan has infested our society with. You can't heal. Others can heal. And if you let him and you're open to it, you show that to others, God can use that to make you and the people who come in contact with mature and complete not lacking anything. Let's pray.